So the beginning of the story is uh, to explain the topics. In the beginning, I'll say a couple of things about basic design of the rotating machine and then explain why some sort of monitoring is useful and what stands behind condition-based monitoring, what does it mean actually. And then four of the technologies that are most frequently used in today's uh, high voltage rotating machines will be explained in um, short terms. And uh, we can discuss about that if you have any questions again during the conversation or later. So the first thing is to explain what is a rotating machine uh, and what is electrical rotating machine. That would be an assembly that will consist of two parts. One is stationary, called stator, and the other one will be rotor, which is spinning, typically inside of the stator. Sometimes it's the other way, but uh, for the case of the high voltage rotating machines, it will be a uh, rotor inside of the stator. In this case, a uh, rotor is made of a single strand of wire, and uh, this picture also indicates uh, three required conditions to produce some sort of electrical power which is combination of current and voltage. You need to have a magnetic field, you need to have a conductor, and you need to have a motion. So in this case, motion is rotational, someone is going to spin the handle, and there will be a voltage build up between the two ends of this coil. So this is how electrical machines operate. Unfortunately, at the end of this presentation, we'll find out that this is also a condition for some of the problems that could happen in rotating machines. And uh, it's not only desirable to have a voltage or current created in a locations which are not necessarily designed for that. So electrical machines can be large. This is a picture of 900 megawatt turbo generator. And on the other end of this tunnel, you can see three people looking at the screen doing something down there. And this is a picture from a hydro machine, which is uh, completely assembled. So there is nothing missing here. And you can see a people standing on a rotor and standing on a stator outside of this ring. And the height between the rotor and this bracket on top is about 10 feet or 3 meters. So you can basically put a basketball net there and play basketball, given enough space in this large hydro generator. Uh, back to turbo machines, the largest one that is uh, ready for operation but not op operating yet is uh, rated 2,222 MBA. And that's the top of the scale for today, um, design limits. Uh, there is another one being uh, recently delivered, but not, again, ready for operation, which is slightly bigger than this one. So two gigawatts of output power has been achieved in a turbo generator, and about one gigawatt of output power was achieved in a hydro generators. Again, not in operation yet, but there are plans and designs for that. When it comes to motors, the largest motor is 80 megawatt. So that's not pumping hydro generator, it's a motor. And when you include uh, pump storage units, uh, there could be more than 300 megawatt in rating. So we are talking about large numbers. We are talking about big uh, machinery. And that machinery requires some sort of care in order to be properly uh, maintained and operated. So when it comes to uh, maintenance, there are a couple of methods. And uh, some methods are based on uh, not do anything, which is breakdown or corrective approach you basically wait for a thing to happen to failure and then you address it and some people can afford to do that if there is enough uh, replacement power or there is enough machinery around so that is not unusual approach unfortunately in today's world uh, production is expensive and important and time is money so people try to do a little bit better than that and one of the methods is uh, going after time-based or preventive maintenance which is based on a calendar and recommendation from the manufacturer which indicates that certain operations need to be taken at certain time periods. So this is a little bit better and a little bit more proactive than the first one but it still doesn't guarantee that you will address the problem on time and that you will be able to recognize the unit with the largest problem. So in order to help operators uh, recognize the differences between their supposedly identical machines, there is something called condition-based or predictive maintenance. So, and that's based on uh, installation of certain sensors that will be used for assessment of the machine while machine is running. And uh, data collected in such way could be used to determine priorities when it comes to maintenance, maybe do some sort of acceptance testing, and maybe in an unfortunate case, uh, do a little bit on root cause analysis of the failure. 
it's important to understand that there is something called offline testing. So machine is stopped and uh, certain instruments are brought in order to generate voltage or current and simulate some conditions and then make a measurement. And online monitoring, that is a topic of today's story, which assumes that the machine is working and uh, either periodic or continuously installed instrument will be connected to a winding or to a rotor winding and monitor the condition of the machine. The other important distinction is difference between monitoring and protection. So protection is tool which is used to minimize the damage. And the protection relay is designed to stop the machine when something happens. And monitoring devices are generally not designed to stop the machine. They are designed to improve the knowledge about condition of the machine rather than to trip the machine from the service. Consequently, monitoring techniques are focused on something which is meaningful and something that can be used in order to properly understand the condition of the machine and something that is developing in a longer period of time, something which is not happening immediately. So monitoring of things that are uh, of short time duration is not really helpful because there is no time to make a corrective action before something bad happens. So that's why we have a relay to minimize the damage. So to compare the offline and online approach, there are a couple of differences here. So again, today we are talking about online and uh, maybe next time will be offline story. Uh, major difference is that machine is in operation with online testing and machine is not operated with offline. So that indicates that machine is not making money, which is not a good sign. Consequently, offline testing is considered to be expensive from that point of view because you are not generating revenue. And uh, in addition to that, from technical point of view, there are a couple of important parameters missing in offline tests, which is there is no load and consequently temperature and vibration are not present. All of that is present during the operation of the machine and it gives you opportunity to capture the data from the machine in operational mode with all of those parameters being present. So that makes a major difference. So question is, what is condition-based maintenance? Well, it's a acronym which is being flown in the last maybe 10, 15 years very frequently. And the idea is to, to, to combine a number of techniques that are available in order to, to, to properly understand the actual condition of the system that you are monitoring. And that condition-based maintenance will include monitoring, inspection, and testing. So monitoring is, again, online data collection. Inspection is occasional inspection that you get a chance to do, maybe visual or some other methods. And then there is a testing using typically electrical and maybe sometimes mechanical instrumentation uh, with machine stopped. If all three of these tools are used, then it gives you a chance to decrease but not to eliminate exposure to forced outage. So in spite of a reach of condition-based monitoring and uh, instrumentation that is used there, in today's world, there is still no perfect test and there is no perfect guarantee that your machine is going to be operated uh, for whatever period of time. So the problems are a result of uh, system issues and there are no methods of controlling or maybe preventing the system problems that could affect the likelihood of the failure in the machine itself. So CBM is an important step, but CBM is not necessarily uh, the perfect scenario for someone who wants to have an answer when my machine is going to fail. Unfortunately, that answer is still not available. So what can be achieved with condition-based monitoring? Well, there are five W's, like in any good journalist approach. Question is which asset or which units to choose for whatever action. Uh, earlier shutdown, uh, more detailed inspection and so on. Then to determine what are the measures that describe degradation of that system, whatever that system is, insulation of the stator or interturn insulation on the rotor and so on. Then question, when is the unit failure likely to occur? As I said, we are not going to answer that question because it's impossible, but it, at least it can make you some uh, parallels between the similar units that you operate and you can see the trends of activities in different units, which might lead you to conclusion that one unit is closer to the end of the life, which is not necessarily meaning that it will be failing first or soon but at least you can establish certain comparable uh, factors between the multiple machines that can help you understand what's going on there. That question is what maintenance action to perform? Well, that can be driven based on data collected and type of the data collected, and then when to do it. You might decide to do it either earlier or later. Uh, one major financial element of all condition-based monitoring stories is uh, not necessarily how much money we saved by doing something, but there is also an important aspect of how much money we saved by not doing something. 
So if you are able to prolong your whatever maintenance you plan, because all parameters that you monitor are stable and there is no reason to stop the machine just because of the sake of maintenance, then there is a huge saving in not doing anything. So people tend to forgot this part of the equation when they do any kind of uh, return on investment benefits or any kind of uh, spreadsheet indicating uh, how much we can save by spending money on this. Well, important saving is by not doing anything. Uh, this chart indicates uh, what kind of uh, uh, maintenance or monitoring could be done or appropriate uh, for certain type of the issue. So on a horizontal axis, we have a downtime and on vertical axis we have a frequency. So in a case that you have uh, problems that are happening very frequently, but they don't take too much of uh, time to fix, we are maybe talking about operator skills or fact that they don't understand what they operate and so on. So that is not the case for condition-based maintenance. However, in the opposite end of this square, if you have a problem that doesn't happen very frequently, so they happen very rarely, but they cost you a lot of time in downtime, then this is something that condition-based maintenance could be useful in order to minimize that huge expense related to downtime. So first technology that I'll be talking about uh, is online partial discharge monitoring. And again, we are talking about uh, high voltage rotating machines. And the definition is that partial discharge is a process that is taking place in or on insulation of the stator winding. And uh, it is happening because of the fact that uh, stator winding is not perfect. and uh, there is a possibility of internal discharges and discharges on the surface between the different phases of that stator winding. Another important thing to understand is partial discharge is a voltage-related phenomena. So if voltage is not high enough, partial discharge is not going to occur. There might be some other processes which might be similar in nature, uh, producing a arcing or sparking or a high current events, but they are not necessarily partial discharge. Consequently, partial discharge is not going to happen in all parts of the stator winding. It is happening only in a part of stator winding which is exposed to sufficiently high voltage and which is suffering from either production or operationally introduced defects, which can help in creation of the partial discharge. The major problem with partial discharge is that it cannot be measured directly. So it needs to be measured through the effects, and there are seven effects listed here. So most of the instruments we will be relying on the last one, which is the creation of the pulse with a wide band frequency spectrum. Some other instruments will be working based on a, on, a, on a optical recognition. Some other instruments are working on detection of the ozone in air cool machines and so on. So in any case, uh, the capturing of the effects indicates the presence of partial discharge. And if you don't have effects of PD, then it's very difficult to conclude that do we really have or we don't have partial discharge happening inside of the machine. To start monitoring, you need to put some sort of sensor, and sensors can be of different uh, colors, different shape, different size, but uh, they are important, and it's so important that sensors are designed for that purpose. So multi-purpose sensors are really not doing an excellent job in collection of the partial discharge pulses. So the sensors that are designed for PD activity collection, uh, collection are better than general purpose sensor, which might be applied as a easier solution because there is something inside of the machine and maybe I can collect the data from there. Maybe, that's just maybe. Uh, once you bring the sensor inside of the machine and permanently install them, there will be some sort of meeting point or connection termination box between the sensor and instrument. And that instrument could be portable or permanently installed. And there are different types of instrumentation which are dedicated for different types of the machine. Uh, in IRIS approach, we recommend installation of the two sensors per phase, and they could be installed in a different method, depending on the type of the machine. If it is a turbo generator or a large motor, which is connected to the bus conductors to a system, then there will be two sensors installed on that bus system. One of them will be called machine side sensor, and the other one will be system side. And that two sensors will be collecting information and filtering based on a time of arrival. So the operator will have a relatively easy picture to understand, telling him that something is happening in the machine and maybe something is happening in the system. And at the same time, the most critical part of any partial discharge measurement is a rejection of the external noise. And uh, with the two sensors per phase, that rejection is done by comparing the arrival time of the pulses coming from the system and arrival time of the pulses coming from the machine. So there will be a time delay between the two events and the instrument itself will separate two in the two columns. So
so operator does not have to think about is this really coming from the motor or generator or this is a system noise. So this makes data analysis much easier. In a case of hydro generators, uh, sensors are typically installed inside of the machine and uh, again there will be two or maybe more on one phase and that two sensors will be connected in a slightly different method comparing to the sensors on a turbo generator but idea is the same. We'll try to look at the timing of the pulse arrival and if timing of that pulse is identical then we will know that pulse is originated from outside of the machine or if the pulse is arriving first to one sensor in this case C2 and then to sensor C1 based on time difference of arrival of the two pulse uh, the instrumentation will classify them in a C1 or C2 pulses or external pulses. So this important distinction uh, that operator will have a relatively easy data understanding based on a graphs produced by software and hardware. Uh, additional method of collecting data is using uh, inductive sensors or a stator slot couplers. Uh, they are recommended for hydrogen cooled machines where space is tight so we cannot go inside with uh, capacitive sensors and uh, we have the separate the pulses uh, based on their place of origin using the antennas so these sensors are installed underneath the stator wedge or maybe between the two stator bars uh, if sensor is installed in production cycle of the machine approach is similar uh, we look at the pulse and then question is what to do with the test results well in last 28 29 years of iris data collection we came to conclusion that certain parameters are critical and certain parameters are not so important for example machine type are we talking about motor or generator is really not important and what type of the bonding resin is being used to keep the insulation layers together is it asphalt polyester or epoxy is again not important but what is important is a test instrument which is used sensors operational voltage uh, pressure of the hydrogen type of installation, when is this machine produced, who made it, and what kind of operational parameters machine is tested at. So we collect all that information in our data collection and based on that we publish a summary of the results and uh, as of end of last year I think we had about 650,000 results in our summary and there is a link you can click on that one and it will lead you to what we call severity tables. That's basically a statistical distribution of the results based on uh, data collected in the last 28 years uh, from different types of the machine using the parameters that we have here. So machines are separated based on a sensor, based on a voltage, based on a hydrogen pressure and so on. So this is a useful guideline in absence of any standard that will regulate how much of PD is too much. So this is a uh, helpful information to a user who can collect the uh, data from the machine and then take a look at the tables and realize immediately after the first test is my machine in a group of high reading or my machine is maybe in a group of average PhD results. To conclude with a partial discharge technology uh, it is well established because it's being used for last 55-60 years in different shapes online monitoring of state of winding insulation it is applicable and frequently found on many rotating machines rated higher than 4000 volts and there are different types of sensors and instruments which are available for data collection depend on type of the sensor and uh, uh, installation method of that sensor. So that was the shortest story on a partial discharge and I will go to next stator technology which is a stator and winding vibration monitoring and we'll try to explain that in a same short presentation. Well what you see on the right side of the photograph is um, two pole turbo generator smaller one and uh, you can see a stator core occupying about half of the picture and then second half of the picture is something which is coming out of the stator core well that coming out is a stator bar that stator bar is carrying the same voltage and more importantly carrying the same current as the stator bar which is sitting inside of the slot unfortunately that stator bar is not well supported inside outside of the slot because we don't have tightly controlled tolerances of the stator core keeping the bar formally in a slot. What we have is assembly of uh, three phases uh, keeping uh, uh, that bars together and you can see some supporting mechanism in white which is designed to, to, to keep the bars together. Uh, it's not simple task and the task is not simple because uh, there are opposing requirements. You have to provide flexibility for thermal expansion of this machine so when temperature goes up with a load going up it's necessary to provide a 
room for the stator bars to expand. At the same time, it is necessary to keep the stator bar firmly positioned to prevent their movement in cycles of normal operation. And we have a forces acting twice per cycle, 100 times in 50 hertz grids and 120 times in 60 hertz grids. And we also might have a system phase, system forces, system fault forces, which might be very high, up to 100 times higher than normal operational forces. So that's the challenge, and that challenge is described here in a slide explaining that uh, the system needs to provide two opposing requirements. One is flexibility, and the other one is resilience towards events that could destroy the, that complete package. On top of that, there is a requirement that all materials used in this part of the machine has to be non-conductive, because stator bar is not shielded and it's grounded only inside of the slot so outside of the slot there is no semiconductive screen there is no shield like on a cable and uh, the potential on a surface of the stator bar could be equal to a potential inside of the bar so consequently designer has to deal with a epoxy with a glue with a blocks of uh, different fiberglass material and some sort of rope which is not conductive the same rule of non-conductive or non-metallic materials is uh, required for sensors that might be installed there with uh, whatever idea monitoring temperature or monitoring movement of this part of the machine so what would be a reason to monitor that one is aging fleet machines are getting older and uh, they shrink same like people and uh, by shrinking of the state of winding components there is more room left for their free movement and that movement is going to result in a uh, abrasion and uh, damage to state or winding, which is really not uh, helpful when it comes to a lifetime, expected lifetime of the machine. In addition to that, in the last couple of years, uh, a lot of uh, accountants is involved in the design of the machine, and uh, they're having a last word when it comes to amount of material to be used, which means that less and less material is used for a machines of higher and higher output. Consequently, the forces are bigger, and uh, there is a less mass associated with keeping the stator bar in place. And because of that, there might be more unwinding vibration on the most recent machines than on machines produced, let's say, 40 years ago. If this vibration is not detected, then uh, failure is possible, and that failure, as explained, could be very expensive. So to give you some idea about the impact of accountant on a design of the machine, there is a comparison between the old and the new generator, which is replacing the old machine on the same footprint. So you can see on top of the turbine output, uh, you can see a generator output, that there is an increase from 390 megawatt to 445 megawatts. So that's about 50 megawatts, more, more than 50 megawatts of output increase on that generator. And if you look at the bottom, you will see the difference in the total weight of the machine. On the left side, older old machine was 385 tons, and new machine was 341 tons. So the designer managed to achieve about 15% increase in the uh, output of the machine with about 15% decrease in um, amount of material used inside of this machine. So that is a big problem, and that is going to result in a shorter lifetime of that machine and the possible problems of this nature that you can see here. So to detect that problems, what can be done? Periodic visual inspection is one method, then periodic impact testing is another method, and there might be a possibility to install the sensor which will monitor movement of the stator bar in operation, which is more important because, as I indicated at the beginning, without machine in operation, which is periodic visual inspection and periodic impact testing, we do not have force which is moving the bar. So it's really not possible to measure vibration. It's possible to look for the evidence of vibration or maybe evaluate how much bar will move with a, this kind of test, which is indicated here. And the same test is also recommended to be used for optimization of the sensor location. So it is important to put a sensor on a place that will be producing most of the displacement rather than on a place where sensor is not going to move. So consequently, sensor installed on a wrong place is really not helping understand what kind of problem you have and how big is the problem. So here on the bottom, you can see the output of the bump test, and you can see the some peaks at 60 and 120 hertz, which is indicator of the bad result. This machine will end up in a resonance condition once operated at 60 hertz, and resonance condition is really bad for the amount of displacement inside of the machine because it becomes nonlinear with the input of the force, and that is something that is really going to shorten the lifetime of that machine. So next uh, 
uh, slate is on uh, sensor itself and the sensor itself is a uh, ceramic so sensor is uh, basically uh, non-conductive and it could cover movement in one or two axes uh, sensor is accelerometer and the information about displacement is going to be collected by uh, integration of the output from this sensor and uh, it will provide information on velocity of the component which is monitored and uh, displacement of the component which is monitored as i mentioned this sensor is non-magnetic non-electrical non-conductive and it is important that it is suitable for operation in the stator end winding as far as temperature rating and as far as conductivity it's connected by fiber optic cable and then that fiber optic cable will go to a converter and that converter is going to be connected to an instrument and instrument will be providing the data analysis and the uh, outputs to the operator so to conclude uh, the levels that were monitored in past were not necessarily good indicator of the levels happening in the machine because uh, traditionally people install the sensors on most convenient places or on places that they consider to be different from geometry point of view rather than on a place which is determined to have high amount of vibration and the numbers that you can see here are part of some guidelines at least in north america there are a couple of uh, documents indicating that the machine should be designed to operate at less than 100 micrometers or four mils and if that's not the case then you might have a situation where some concern about longevity of that winding will be relayed because if machine is having more than 10 mils or more than 250 micrometers of displacement that is indication that something is moving more than it should be moving uh, it is better to monitor continuously because uh, with a periodic inspection you do not get ability to really see these numbers in a situation where machine is hot and machine is operated at full load next technology is a rotor and it is dedicated to rotor shorter turns monitoring and uh, it is uh, in the other words monitoring of the air gap flux so the flux between the rotor and the stator will be captured by some sort of sensor and uh, that sensor will indicate the presence of a problem on a rotor so sensor is not installed on a state on a rotor sensor is installed on a stator and one of the reasons for this monitoring is to assist in analysis of vibration problems detected on a bearings of the machine a uh, machine is designed to operate with a certain number of shorter turns so the short turn itself or sh rotor shorter turn itself is not a catastrophic scenario that is going to stop the machine uh, it is a problem that could result in a reduced output but typically exciters is designed to, to, to compensate for a number of shorter turns so that is again not big deal but big deal is when machine is uh, having an increased vibration levels because of the rotor shorter turns without this technique without monitoring the rotor shorter turns operator will not have easy time concluding what's the reason for appearance of so-called thermally induced vibration on my bearing so result or reason for that uh, uh, increase in vibration is uh, unequal thermal loading of the rotor in a case that uh, there is a shorter turn on one side of the rotor typically two pole rotor and there is no shorter turns on the other side then thermal balance is affected and one side of the rotor is going to be warmer than the other one uh, resulting in a different expansion of the two sides of the rotor and basically making a rotor a little bit curved not as much as this picture but curved enough to produce vibration so the sensor is called flux probe there are different designs different styles it's installed on a stator and thanks to the fact that the rotor is spinning we are able to have all conductors flying in front of the flux probe collecting the data and uh, that data looks like something like this well this is really not user-friendly diagram and this diagram is a result of the measurement and some processing is required in order to make um, information meaningful for a user that processing is based on integration of the signal which is a green line in this case then processing of uh, zero level of that integrated signal which is a vertical green line and then that's the determination of the sweet spot for a judgment of this machine some improvements have been made in the last couple of years in order to expand that sweet spot which traditionally was linked to a position of flux density zero crossing which is this green line so there's some results 
can be collected on a machine using newer technologies without requirement to change the loads, still maintaining the sufficient sensitivity for the rotor short return detection. So idea is to compare the, in a case of two pole machine, two poles, pole A in a blue and pole B in a red, and then to look for a difference, coil to coil, pole to pole. In this case, there is a small difference on a coil number six, which is not really big indicator of a problem or not easy to see, but if that indication is uh, shown at different loads, then user can conclude that there is a problem in coil six at different position of flux density zero crossing, indicating that change of the load on this machine did not change the indication of the short. So I was able to collect the data at any load and to see the behavior or presence of this short on this machine at low load on the right side, on the left side, and a higher load on the right side. What counts the most is not this graph, that graph, or this graph. Really, this graph is the, what the user is looking for. Where is my problem and uh, on which coil, on which pole and which coil is my problem. So that's uh, around machines on a hydro generators or a salient pole motors. Uh, the graph is slightly different looking, but uh, the approach is the same. We collect the data, we integrate the signal, and then we compare signals from different poles in order to find out which pole is different. In addition to indication about the presence of the rotor short returns, it is possible to come to conclusion what is the shape of the rotor. So in this case, we have a two uh, graphs coming from the same set of results. So this is the same measurements on the left side and on the right side. On the left side, we used one of the three algorithms mentioned here. And on the right side, we used another algorithm. So algorithm on the left is comparing each pole to average reading of all poles, and it's indication of the shape of the rotor. On the right side, we compare each pole to the neighbors on left and right. In that case, we can see is that pole which we are comparing different from two poles on the other side, excluding the distance from the sensor which is affecting the, this measurement. So we can basically filter the measurement for the variability of the air gap, and we can compare how the two results look like. So on top, there is a flux signal, and on the bottom, there is an air gap monitoring signal, which indicates the same thing, that rotor on this machine, as visible on the left slide, or left picture here, is really not circular, and that non-circularity is indication that air gap is different in different places. However, that did not stop us from collecting the data and finding out that there are no shorter turns on this rotor. In the case of the shorter turns, one of the poles will be visibly different in output, lower output than the other poles. To conclude, this is again online method. It's a relatively simple test to collect uh, data and uh, it could be done again with portable continuous instruments. And the main role is to assist in vibration analysis because again, uh, having a short term rotor is not good news, but it's not catastrophic for the operation of the machine. And the last technology I have to talk about today is again on a spinning part of the machine. This time it's on a shaft. So analysis of the voltages and currents on shaft. To remind you, we started this morning with a story about the generator and there are three things required to make electrical current. Well, the three things are present here. There is a conductor, which is shaft. There is rotation, which is produced by turbine. And there might be undesirable magnetic field somewhere around the shaft. So once you combine that three, you might end up with a current and voltage inside of the shaft, which you really don't want to have because A, shaft is not a good conductor, and B, shaft is grounded only on one point. So it is possible that my, some breakdown of the oil film, which is really tiny film, that shaft is swimming in, could happen. And then you might have a current going on a place where it was not supposed to go, which will result in a damage to a bearings and the shaft itself. So what could be a reason for a shaft voltage and current? Well, any kind of asymmetry might be a reason because machines are three-phase systems. And if the three phases are not completely symmetrical, cancellation of three magnetic fields is not going to be completely perfect. And there is a possibility of creation of the remanent magnetic field that will produce a magnetic field in a part of the shaft and then consequently current and voltage. Rotor and stator winding faults are also possible because they are not going to be symmetrical. Then there could be magnetized parts in proximity of the shaft as a result of certain non-destructive non but magnetic field testing. So there are magnetic arrays testing for the retaining rings, for example, and so on. And there are uh, arc welders being used on a place where they shouldn't be used. 
And then there might be a situation where there are some spikes coming from static excitation system or introduction of the static voltage from the turbine side in a case of uh, undercooled steam coming from the boiler. So if the steam temperature is not perfectly good, uh, a couple of degrees lower, 10, 15 degrees lower is sufficient to create a particle that will produce the static voltage on side, inside of the turbine. So that also could be a bit of a problem. And uh, for that purpose, there will be effective grounding is required. And unfortunately, that grounding is relying on a one, maybe two carbon brushes, which are selected based of on convenience, they are not necessarily the best choice when it comes to grounding task. They are a good choice for conduction of the current for exciter or current for some uh, slip rings or something like that, but they are not necessarily a good choice for grounding of the whole, uh, shaft. And if they are not doing a good job, then there could be high voltage created on a shaft, which could result in a breakdown of the insulation seal and so on. So how we recognize this problem? Well, problem is recognized by monitoring the current through the shunts which are installed on a grounding brushes, and by monitoring the voltage on additional voltage sensing brushes, which might be installed on a different place along the shaft. There could be on a turbine side, generator side, or they could be side by side with grounding brushes, monitoring the performance of the grounding brush by multiple criteria. One criteria is how big is the current going to ground, and the other criteria will be, do we have a voltage there or not? So that is connected to a, some sort of instrument, and that instrument will, again, process data, collect the data, and display in some meaningful term. What are the indicators of what we can find out from there? Well, if the grounding brush current is too low, that's indication that grounding brush is not doing its job. If that current is very high, then we might have a situation where the shaft is really carrying important level of current, or, and that current is being closed to a multiple grounding points. So that's, again, not a good sign. And if there is a voltage brush and the signal is coming as a very high voltage, there is a risk of the bearing and seals insulation breakdown. So that's warning signs that operator can be informed about collecting data from this system. Uh, question is also what's normal? Well, same like with many other parameters in rotating machines, uh, there are some indicators collected as a result of the practice, but there are no standards, there are no guidelines, there are no rules that you can use to corner the manufacturer and say this is too much or so on. So it comes down to 5 to 10 volts or 5 to 10 amps is considered to be something that you can live with, and if you have bigger than that, then there is a problem with the uh, uh, grounding quality or maybe some other issue which is causing the current or voltage to be higher than desirable. To conclude, this system is designed to produce early warnings. Early warning because the change in a grounding or change in a current level on the on a shaft could lead to major problems down the road. Problem is, it's not easy to recognize what the problem is going to happen. So that's why recommendation is that system to be used as a part of condition-based monitoring system together with other methods that can produce simultaneous information indicating that there is explanation why shaft voltage is all of a sudden bigger or something like that. So to help user in that, there is something that IRIS offers as integrated monitoring system. And that integrated monitoring system is on a plug and play modules. It's called GUARD2. On the left side, there is a partial discharge system. On the right side, there are modules which are designed to collect data from flux probe and winding vibration probes or shaft monitoring probes. And uh, that looks something like this. There will be four termination boxes, maybe. Uh, top is shaft, flux, PD, and then winding. And that four termination boxes will have signals brought to one instrument with one IP address, with one Modbus communication to Ethernet, and one software package that will be used to collect the data from that one box and, and then analyze data in four different technologies because each of them is producing the results in different terms. So that's basically my 40 minutes of the story. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead.